Hi, my friends, it's David Alt, and I want to welcome you to The Gathering. Let's dive into a really big subject, and that is the topic of the heart. Not the physical organ of the heart, but the heart that is the subject matter of all things spiritual. Uh, the instruction about don't close the heart, the uh, wisdom of the cosmic heart, the spiritual heart, the portal of the heart. There are so many stories, so many allegories, so many things that pinpoint about the necessity to keep the heart open. But what does that actually mean? And I find that when things are so broad and so big, like this topic about the heart, that sometimes we lose ourselves in a sort of an unconscious agreement where we just kind of nod our head at something and really miss an opportunity to make it granular, to make it personal, so that the application of it really not only fuels us, but challenges us in our unconsciousness to become more aware. And that, to me, is the case that I see often when the subject of the heart uh, comes into play. There's a, a book I'm sure you're familiar with called The Untethered Soul, and the author, Michael Singer, talks often about the heart and about not closing the heart, and that when we do, there are repercussions that come with that. There is suffering that comes with that. And that no matter what happens, no matter what happens on the surface of the canvas of this plane of form, in other words, whatever happens in the day-to-day -day existence of humanity, that we are strongly encouraged not to close the heart, to keep it open. Because once we keep it open, then we become more and more accustomed to and available to experience this thing, this inexplicable uh, feeling and experience called freedom. Freedom and or the quantitative nature of freedom, the understanding of true freedom, is all equated to whether or not our hearts are open. So if you want to be free, you have to keep your heart open, right? Free of mental suffering, free from unconscious um, issues that keep us caged and locked into stale story. And so keeping the heart open. And I remember in that book, The Untethered Soul, um, Michael Singer saying something simple like, you know, and if you want to be free, then just don't close the heart. Easier said than done, right? Because there are so many things that pull at us. It's as if we're walking around like a, a dartboard and all of the things that are systemic issues and fears and lack are throwing themselves at us. And it's very, very hard not to go into some reactive mode and to try to protect ourselves. Keep the heart open. So I wanted to do a little examination to make it more accessible about what that means and to look at what are some of the tools that we could bring forth into our everyday spiritual practice about keeping the heart open. Um, I want to draw your attention to this quote and it's by this really phenomenal um, historian and writer. His name is, his full name is René Adolf Schwaller de Lubitsch. Say that with me five times. René Adolf Schwaller de Lubitsch. And he was a, an Egyptologist, a, a rather controversial Egyptologist, who was at the forefront of trying to get people to understand the mystical nature about all of the things, all of the structures, all of the uh, sacred geometry, all of the deeper meaning behind the landscape that we know now in Egypt with the pyramids and things like that. And um, he was very much into blending mathematics and symbolism and spirituality. And so he wrote this amazing book called The Temple of Man. And The Temple of Man 
is a, a metaphor, if you will, that we as humans, um, we are temples. We are living, breathing temples. We're walking around. And when you think about that, which I love, when you think of yourself as a temple, are the doors closed? Um, is the interior neglected? Or their old and stale debris that is clouding that temple? Or is there a steady flow of keeping the portal of that temple open? Is there a, a daily cleansing that is taking place? Because to be a temple, which is kind of like a, a place of respite, a place where someone enters and automatically can remember the truth and the authenticity of who they are. So if someone is in your presence and you are activating and owning yourself as a temple, they can then know the truth for themselves. But if our heart is closed, we're still a temple. But if our heart is closed, we are sort of like a non-functioning temple. And all of a the sudden, there is no real authentic freedom or communication that transpires in those type of interpersonal relationships. So Rene Adolf Schwaller de Lubitsch, he said this, if someday, if someday it is given to you to pass into the inner temple, you must leave no enemies behind. Let me read that again. If someday it is given to you to pass into the inner temple, you must leave no enemies behind. I've used this in some online classes, and we talked a little bit about this at a retreat, and this quote is actually found in the original seminal Be Here Now text as well, where Ram Dass talked a little bit about this. But when people hear it, sort of at first blush, they, they hear it as if it's referring to when we die, when we depart the body and we go into some inner temple as if it's a location that is futurized or separate from us. But remember, the temple is us. The inner temple is that heart, the core, the portal. And he says, if someday it is given to you to pass into the inner temple, so the way that I see that is if someday you wake up, if someday there is a quantifiable spiritual awakening, um, uh, a, an opening within you where you see the reality of God in existence within all things, you can subscribe to a mystical understanding of a perfect patterning or a holistic union Everything is one. Everything is a part of the whole. If someday you get to go to the inner temple of that awareness, you must leave no enemies behind. You must leave no caveats, no whataboutisms, no person, place, or thing outside of the inner temple. You must bring everything into the temple with you. So what does that mean? Uh, uh, for me, it's spiritual awakening, the degree of the spiritual awakening, the degree of the commitment of keeping the inner temple or the heart open, is the degree by which everything that consummates our life, person, place, things, story, people, relationships, conflict, victories, Everything comes into the inner temple with me. I don't exclude anything. It's all an inclusive act of harmony that I bring in. I cannot reserve a story or a person or an event as an exception. Everything then comes into the inner temple. If someday it is given to me the opportunity to be aware of this inner temple, to enter into its presence, to feel that transformation, then the sustainability of that, the, uh, the home of that, the naturalness of that, the freedom that comes with that has only one requirement, and that is you can leave no enemies behind. Why? Because then there is no enemy. So when we're in spiritual atmosphere, when we're in the temples of our own human design, call it church, organization, whatever, 
when we're in those places and we talk about these types of things, it is readily acceptable to nod our head and go, mm -hmm. and yet the day to day, this thing that we witness, and sometimes even in this particular phase of evolution with media and speed and the sensation by which we the, we can witness the, the worldwide events in real time, it seems particularly difficult to keep the heart open. And there's no rule book with how you can do that. There is no set standard or steps in order to really authenticate that remaining heart open. It is only by being in the midst of the storm that we can remember this invitation. It is only by being in the midst of the seeming chaos and conflict that we can remember that even in this, there is an inner temple. Even in this, there is a choice to keep the heart open. I am not 100% uh, successful at this, but I, I want to be. I do. I want to know that kind of freedom. I want to not be oblivious to the needs of the world and the conflict of the world and the discrimination of the world and the ongoing foreverness of systemic issues that will be a part of the yin-yang in the world. I do not want to bury my head in the sand with that. But what I do want is that when I'm in the arena with it, that I somehow find a way to keep my heart open. And I find that, and this may sound very um, paradoxical and ironic, but I find sometimes that when the issue is much bigger, I'm more successful. But when it's maybe a personality, a little grievance, a little annoyance, that those types of things have a much greater ability to allow my heart to close. It's as if there's a sort of camaraderie among other people going, God, they're so annoying, right? Or, ah, these people are awful. And can you believe what the, they did? Can you believe what this organization did, what this company did, what this group did? And we can always, we will always, always find people to be in agreement. Uh, it, you know, we could call it sort of the closed heart club. We can always find people to do that because it is such a human thing. But if by chance it has given us the opportunity to enter into the inner temple, and I can say that I have, there have been moments. You know, in the science of mind philosophy, there is a, a, a section that I have taught over the years about what is a mystic. And it's one of my favorite pieces because it says that we are all mystics. Mystics is not something that is reserved for holy people. That our nature, by nature, we are mystics. And the definition of mystic is being fully aware that all is connected, that all is God, having that awareness. And so sometimes when we think about, did I have a mystical moment? Did I have a mystical experience? We may reflect back to childhood when in the untainted innocence of our lives, perhaps we were outside staring into a flower and in the midst of that flower, we saw the cosmos. It could be sometimes just an overwhelming sensation that grabs us unexpectedly and we feel this union and harmony with everything. Lately, when I've been working with people or being at retreats or one-on-ones, I will hear an occasional story, which to me registers as, oh, that's a mystical experience, where all of a sudden the world, as we knew it, kind of stopped 
perhaps things went into slow motion, but there was such a quantifiable peace and, and beauty and um, deep resonance and harmony with all of life. It may not last very long, but it's there nonetheless. And that experience is what I can imagine and a little bit of what I have felt when I've been into the inner temple and allowed myself to keep my heart open to go, oh my God, that, them, oh, I see, wow. And having that sort of mind-blowing understanding that all things work together for good. And so when you think about scriptures like that, all things are working together for good. Or the other one that I remember was, prepare within me a clean heart, O God. Prepare within me a clean heart, O God, like a daily prayer. It made me think of, all of this made me think of the word intention. And intention there is a little bit of a sterility about it where it can feel very mechanistic like okay we're gonna we're gonna create these intentions like these building blocks for what's going to happen and that to me is not really an intention an intention is not forced thinking an intention is not forced concentration uh, being intentional is not really manipulating anything in the external. To me, intention is, a, is an active surrender. Like it, it's an active surrender. And when I say active surrender, I want, to, I want you to understand the paradox of that. It's not waving the white flag and just saying, Oh, I'm not enough, I can't do it, and, and, and being some type of human doormat. Act of surrender means that I take, I take my temple-ness, my inner temple, my understanding, and I enter into the world. I bring my gift, my heart, into the world. But I do so with an act of surrender, which is equated to use me. Take me to where it is that you would want me to be. Okay, I'm here. What is it that you would have of me? My intention is to be actively surrendered, to give up the how, the ways and the means, and to be completely 100% available to the active surrender of that which is the inner atmosphere of that temple, that wisdom, that peace, that freedom. Guide my steps, take my hands, take my feet, take my voice, my sight. Use all of this temple in order to be fully available. And the more that that active surrender becomes a normalcy, a new normal perhaps, it's not as difficult to keep the heart open. Because I find that when I am in this active surrender, I'm not so much caught in my head. I'm not so much defaulting to old patterns of control. Oh my God, I've gotta, I gotta do this and I gotta do this and I gotta do this. There's so much more of a breathability and an ease in all of this. And I can let certain people be, and I can let certain circumstances be. And I don't have to push, force, or conjole. I don't have to convince. That to keep my heart open simply means that my prayer is every day, um, prepare within me a clean heart, O oh God. An act of surrender. And so if by chance you have had a mystical experience, a moment, where you realize the complete unity of all life. If by chance there is something within you that understands that freedom is not an escape. 
Freedom is not purchase power. Freedom is not anything other than the fact that that you are in a sustainable knowing that all is God and all is life and all is well. That's freedom. And that comes in equation to our ability to keep our heart open. So take note of the things and the people that make your heart want to close. Start there. Before you go to bed at night, what have you placed outside of your heart? Just draw it back in. Not by some grandiose design, but by simply saying, come back in, come back in. We need not navigate or manipulate anything other than that. So if by chance the inner temple is what's calling you, if by chance you do want to practice keeping your heart open, then start with what is outside of it right now and simply begin to practice bringing it back in. God bless.